Bibles to uh, John chapter 21. John chapter 21. We're, we're going to be in week two of a, of a, I don't know how, how many weeks it'll be, but a little series that we're titled, uh, of a title, this Journey from the Tomb. And I mentioned last week that oftentimes we'll do a journey through Christmas or a journey t- to the tomb. We do, a, we do a lead up, a run up onto those special days and special events. But we wanted to do a kind of a walk out from the tomb and, and look at some of the things that the Lord did in those those days before he ascended back into heaven and then with Pentecost and all the things that came after that. We want to look at that. And so it, here's what's interesting. The songs this morning, especially that last song that we just sang, now pa- Pastor Aaron prepares weeks in, in advance. So he would have prepared that weeks out. Maybe a couple of months ago he would have p- picked that song. Uh, but he couldn't have picked a better song if he had known yesterday what we were doing today. And so it's amazing how the Lord again and again and again puts these things together. So as we look at this journey from the tomb, the title of the message is, is this morning is this, uh, Out of My Comfort Zone. Anybody ever been out of their comfort zone? All right, right. Some of you are out of your comfort zone having to raise your hand right now. You're like, I'm preacher, I don't want to do it. So uh, but that's kind of the theme of what we're going to talk about this morning. So there in John chapter 21, we're going to look at, we'll look at, we'll get to it here in just a little bit, the first 14 verses today. But I want to ask some questions first. So what are things that get you out of your comfort zone? Think about that, some things that get you out of your comfort zone. So I've made a list of a few that I think might apply, and then maybe you have something you could add to this. So public speaking, I think that gets, gets most people out of their comfort zone. New situations, new situations, whether it's a new job or a new relationship or a new you know, you buy a new home or you got, a, you know, new children. We've got a grandchild on the way. That's going to be new for us. There's these new. So new situations, new people. Uh, you meet new people. You've got new people that are in your life, whether through a job. You've got to work with somebody new and there's, that gets you out of your comfort zone. Uh, you know, for some people, being alone, being alone is out of their comfort zone. And then the opposite of that, some people are, you know, they're really out of their comfort zone in a crowd. You get them in a crowd and it's just the opposite. Uh, failing or failure at something can really push you out of your comfort zone. Conflict or confrontation can quickly get us out of our comfort zone. But change, I think change is probably one of the keys, it, and, and it can be any change. Any kind of change in our life can bring us, push us out of our comfort zone. Anybody got anything that you can think of, that other things that would add to that, just things that get you out of your comfort zone? Patience, waiting, waiting. So situations where you have to be patient. So waiting. Okay. Anybody else? I'm making my list. I'm, next time I preach this, it'll be better. <laughs> Anybody else? Technology. technology. Oh, that's a good one. So, so the new technology sometimes it's a little harder. I'm finding that more and more. Things that were easier for me ten years ago aren't as easy with the way things are changing. And I'm not necessarily keeping up. And so, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Anybody else? Miss Rita? I-4. <laughs> so, so death traps, death traps make you uncomfortable is what you're telling me. Okay. Miss Rita? Old age. Old age. Okay. okay so, so some of you will have to wait a while to see if she's right. All right. Um, some of us can amen that as we're getting a little older and seeing things that, that things I used to could do that now I can't do starts to push you out of your comfort zone. That's a good one. Yes, ma'am. Serving. Serving. Okay. Susan? Sharing with friends who have a higher education. Sharing with friends who have a higher education. So make you feel a little insecure. Okay. All right. All right, that's, that's, that's true. I, I get that. Look, when John Reynolds is here, and I've preached in front of John Reynolds or Aaron Reynolds or some others, when Glenn's here, those are, those are intimidating for me. It pushed me out of my comfort zone, so I get that. I understand that. All right, anybody else? Anybody else? All right. What was that? Doctors. Okay. All right. So, so those are things that maybe push us out of our comfort zone. Now I want you to think about this. What do we do when we feel uncomfortable? What do we do when we feel uncomfortable? So, so some things I wrote down is, here's what we do. We hide or, or we find shelter. Now, I mean that 
probably not like literally run into a building, but we find a place where we can get away from the thing that's making us uncomfortable. We shelter away from that. We find somewhere where we feel safe, uh, not vulnerable. A lot of those things that we just named about comfort, when we get into areas that make us feel vulnerable, and those are all things that can make us feel vulnerable, make us feel insecure, then that, that's somewhat. So we want to get to a place where we're, we don't feel vulnerable. Um, place where we, 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 we try to flee from the situation. It, whatever it is that's making us uncomfortable, whatever's gotten us out of our comfort zone, we tend to want to flee from that situation. I want to get away from that situation, and then it'll be better. That's kind of how we think. Uh, we seek to find the normal again. Right, so this is what I was comfortable with, and this has pushed me out of it, so I want to get back to what, what's normal. Any, any other thoughts? Pray. What's that? Pray. You pray? That's a great answer. That's a very spiritual answer. I, I'm, you're more spiritual than me. I didn't have that on my list. But praying, absolutely, that's a great, that should push us to prayer. Yep. So retirement. So retirement has, has pushed you out of your your comfort zone. Well, you worked a long, long, long time, and then you're not that thing that was normal is no longer normal. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, we seek that. We seek normal. We try to find. I, I know, Bill. We've talked about. I think we've talked about this. You seek that to find the new normal. What is the new normal in life? Uh, anybody else? Any other thoughts, real quick? What's that? Well, yep, that would bring, that would bring, push us out of our comfort zone. Absolutely, the death. Uh, so when we try, when we feel that, and we're feeling that uncomfort, we're, we, we, here's what we try to do: we try to go back to our comfort zone. So that means you got to think about where is you know what's my comfort zone? Where is it that that I'm comfortable? Where is it that I'm? And that's what we're going to talk about this morning because we want to go back to that. Now, th- those words right there, "go back," are intentional. Because that's, that tends to be what we do, amen? We go back. We, we go back. And going back isn't always the best thing. In fact, in most cases, it's not the best thing is when we go back. Uh, it could be now, the uh, opposite of that is if I've gotten away from the Lord, to go back to where I was with the Lord, and that's a time that going back. But most of the time in this kind of a situation, when we talk about starting to get out of our comfort zone, what do we do? We go back. And we go back, not forward. We go back and we're, we're, we're going back and we want to find that zone of comfort. Whatever that was for us, we want to get back to that because whatever it is has made us uncomfortable, whatever situation has made us uncomfortable. So that's what we're looking at this morning is, is this thought of our comfort zone and what pushes us out of our comfort zone. And then when we're uncomfortable, what do we do? What do we try to get back to that comfort zone? Is that what we're trying to do? Now, following Jesus is a life of comfort and ease. It, it is. Just ask the disciples. Think about, think about them. Jesus called them to follow him. And he said this to them. He says, follow me. And he says, follow me. And he said, I will make you fishers of men. So seven, at least seven of the 12 that he called to be his 12 disciples were fishermen. So he's called them to walk away from their careers He's walked, they're to leave what they know. They're to leave their source of income. They're to leave the thing that's comfortable for them. That's what Jesus' first thing he does. Come follow me. They don't even know him all that well. And he's saying, come and follow me. And he tells them, and I want to say this now, when, when, he, when he calls us as a disciple, it's no different than it was for them. When he says, follow me, he says, I will make you fishers of men. That calling is the same for us today as it was for them 2,000 years ago. Amen? It is. Amen? Amen. Y'all, some of you aren't convinced. You're like, no, 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 no. That's not everybody's call. But hopefully you're going you're to see that it is. Um, they walked away from their jobs. They walked away. They, they didn't abandon their families, but they walked away from family and security and some of those things. And they followed Jesus for two plus years. They didn't live in one place. They served others, not themselves. They witnessed firsthand incredible, incredible miracles. And yet at the same time, they they were experiencing great fear of of even being killed for associating with Jesus. 
There were times, there were times where, hey, those folks want to kill you, Lord, and you want us to go right back into that? They, they would have feared for their own lives. So it's, uh, when we think about the disciples, it was the real, it was real lifestyles of the rich and famous right there stuff. You know, that's what it was. Amen? Not. To be a disciple wasn't very comfortable. It was not a comfortable situation. You know, Jesus had told them in Mark chapter 8, uh, chapter 8 verse 34, he said, deny, paraphrasing, he said, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. He taught them to store up treasure in heaven, not here on earth. Boy, that's counter to everything we're brought up learning and knowing and believing. Well, you got to save it up here. You got to get all you can, make all you can, keep all you can and all that stuff. Uh, Luke 12, 34 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So it's a whole different thinking about our finances. He told them again and again and again. He said, forgive, forgive, forgive. Wow, that was hard. That was difficult. That's not what they were used to. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Boy, that was very comforting as well. Boy, Lord, you're just a, you're just, man, you're just a wealth of encouragement and, and making us feel real good. But it was all true. What he told them was true. And the call to follow him was not an easy call. Listen, dying and sacrifice are hard. When you talk about taking up your cross and following him, that is a call to deny yourself, to crucify your flesh, to, to die to me and to follow him. It, it's sacrifice. It's dying. Lifestyle changes are hard. Facing tribulation is hard. Forgiving can be hard. It's, 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 it's a very comfortable lifestyle, eh? It's not very comfortable. It's not a comfortable lifestyle. It's not comfortable at all. In fact, it's very uncomfortable to follow the Lord. You know, and, and we would say today, I would say this today, if your life is just a life of ease and comfort, we're not doing something right. Nowhere did the Lord promise that. Boy, you follow me and life's just, it's, you know, if you follow that train of thought, you end up where the prosperity gospel is today, preaching a false gospel that's all about you and it's not about Christ at all. It ain't about his will and his plan and his design. It's all about you. You're the center of the universe. That is not the scriptures, folks. They gave up comfort to follow Jesus. They left their comfort zones to follow the Lord. And so they followed him, and then Jesus is crucified, and he dies on the cross at Calvary. They're alone, okay? So now they're, they're already out of their comfort zone, and they're following the Lord and all the changes in their life. And now the one they're following has died. He's been buried. And so they're alone, and they're fearful, and they're hiding, and they're in despair. And they're pushed even more out of their comfort zone. And then there's resurrection Sunday morning. Now, listen, I want you to understand this. We come and celebrate the rising of the sun on Resurrection Sunday morning, looking back at that. They didn't have the same feeling that morning as the sun came up. They were in despair. They were really lost and hopeless, knowing what are we going to do now? And then there's the report that comes that the body of Jesus has been stolen. And now on top of this, he died. He's been buried. Now they've stolen his body. That grieved them. They're out of their comfort zone anymore. So then they begin to hear the rumors that Jesus is alive. Mary who sees him face to face. The other women who meet him face to face. And they're telling these things and, and others didn't believe it. I mean, can you blame them? We try to, we try to, oh, I can't believe I didn't believe them. Well, I mean, you come up and tell me you see Jesus face to face. <laughs> Watch my face. I'm going to say, uh, 911, we got. <laughs> so Mary sees him. The other lady sees Peter, Peter sees the Lord face to face. We know that. Then the, we don't know when, we don't know the circumstances. We don't know what was talked about, but we know Peter had seen the Lord. And then the two that come back, those that were on the road to Emmaus, and they met the Lord, and they didn't even know it was the Lord until he revealed it to them, and boom, he was gone. They come back, and they report that they've seen him. And so then finally on that Sunday night, that first resurrection Sunday, that first resurrection Sunday, that evening, they see him. The Lord appears to them as they're gathered together, still in fear. And look, he pops in, and he pops out. He's there, and then he's gone. So things are different. He came, he spoke to them, he offered to eat some things and stuff. It was a very short time, it appears, that he was there, and he's gone. And can you imagine how they must have, I mean, I, I can see it. I mean, see it in color. Did you see that? Did, did you see that? Was that, it wasn't just me. You saw it, okay. 
And, and that, then they've got to be wondering, is this real? Do we really see this? Are we, are we losing our minds? Are, what's going on here? So there, there, there's this, you know, was it a dream? Are they, are they losing it? What's going on? And so then after that resurrection Sunday, they don't see the Lord again for a whole week. It's a whole week that goes by. They've seen him. He's alive, but now he's not. Isn't it? You would think, well, he's going to hang out with us again. He'll be with us all the way through this. He's not. He's there. He's gone. A whole week goes by. He's alive, but things have changed, and he's not staying with them. He's not with them all the time. He pops in. He pops out. He's there. He's gone. Uh, he sure kept them on their toes, though, because at that point, they don't know when he's going to show up, right? They don't know when he's going to pop in, and they're going to see him, and uh, it could be at any moment that the Lord's here. They were really, they really probably, man, they're really on their toes. They're really conscious of what they're doing. You know what? We ought to be the same way. Today, we ought to be on our toes. Amen? Because the Lord has told us he's coming back. And he hasn't told us when. But I, I, I can tell you right now, there's nothing hindering his return. He could come at any moment. Any moment. And, and we go, I can't believe how those disciples acted. You know what? We act like he's not coming back at all. Many times we act like there's, you know what? Tomorrow's as sure as anything. And we just live like next month, next week, next month, next year, I mean, 10 years from now, it's all, it's just set in stone. It's going to happen because we just, that's the way we think. Well, we ought to be thinking like them at this point. The Lord may show up at any moment. He may come back and we want to live our lives so that we're not, man, can you imagine the second he comes back? Can you imagine the regret we're going to feel? It's that quick. It's the, it's the, the, it's the thought after the blue lights go on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. The instant the blue lights go on, you go, oh, man, I knew it. I knew I should have slowed down. I knew I should have stopped at that. I knew I shouldn't have rolled through that stop sign. Whatever. It all runs through our minds. We, the instant, it'll be the same way when the Lord returns and he calls us and we're, and we're raptured up. We're going we're gonna to think about those things of what we could have done and should have done because at that moment, it's too late. Well, here's the deal. They're out of their comfort zone. You know what? And today, if we're really honest, if we're, we're living for the Lord, we ought to be, we really ought to be out of our comfort zone. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, I just pray now as we really get into this, this message this morning that you'll, you'll guide my thoughts, you'll guide my speech, you'll give me clarity in my thoughts and help me to clearly communicate, Lord, the thoughts that you put on my, my heart this morning. And I pray that you'll speak to every one of our hearts, every one of us, Lord. You may speak to someone. You may bring conviction or, or instruction or direction or encouragement in something that I don't even share. But I know, Lord, when the Word of God is preached, the Holy Spirit of God is working in that. So I pray that you'll work this morning. You'll take your Word, the powerful Word of God, and that the Holy Spirit of God will move among us. And every person in here today, will, there will be some area of our life where, Father, we're just going to draw a little closer to you. Use this, Lord, in our, in our lives today to help us to be more like Jesus. And we'll praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Jesus died. He rose again. Then they've seen him. But, they, but, they're, but they're not sure what to do now. You know, he's, he's appeared to them. He waited a week. He shows up again. He's there a short time. He really interacts with Thomas more than anybody, what it, what it appears there. And then he's gone again. And so they're not, they're not sure what to do. They may have been more out of their comfort zone right then at that moment than they had ever been in their lives. I mean, they've truly been pushed out of it. It is not a comfortable situation they're in. So we come to John 21. And let's read through John 21 through the first 14 verses. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll continue on here. So John 21, verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And, and, and in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin. Now, we call him Doubting Thomas, but they called him Thomas the twin. Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. Nathaniel's the one who said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? The sons of Zebedee, that's James and John. And then two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to, to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had, had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not yet know that, that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. 
So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it, into, it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, and it's John who's writing this, it's John who's speaking this, and, and, and Jesus, or John said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, or about 100 yards, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And all there were, although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So the Lord had instructed the disciples to meet him in Galilee, and that explains why they were up there at the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. As I said, there was multiple names for that sea, but we know it as the Sea of Galilee. But they were there because the Lord had previously told them to go, to meet them there. So they had obeyed that, and after that second visit, a week later, when the Lord appeared, after that they went up, and they're up now at the Sea of Galilee. They're gathered together, and the Lord appears to them in this. But they're up there. In verse 3 it says, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said, the others that were with him, we're going with you also. Now, that word going is, is a word we want to look at a little bit right here. Because here's what that word, it's the word hupago. Hupago. And it means this, it means to lead oneself under. To lead under or to lead oneself under. And, and, and that is, it, it means this, it means to withdraw or retire as if sinking out of sight. So the idea is that Peter says, I'm going fishing. So what is Peter doing? He's shrinking back. He's going back. He's going back to his comfort zone. He's going back to what he knows. What was Peter? He was a fisherman. He was a professional, professional fisherman. He was a good fisherman. He made a living at that. He knew that. And it was a place of comfort for him. And it's obvious that that's what he's doing, that he's going back. And we'll look at in a moment some of the views on, on that. But, but, but I think it's easy to see from that idea that, that, you know, Peter was ready. It seems like he was ready to quit being a disciple and go back to what he knew best, fishing. John didn't explain why Peter decided to go fishing. And the Bible scholars disagree on the suggestions. Some claim that he was perfectly right, uh, perfectly within his rights, and, and that, that he needed to pay his bills and the best way to get money was to go fishing. That's what you know. Go back to that. Earn a, earn a living and, and provide for your bills right now. Why to sit around idle? Get busy. Now, I want to share something with you. Sometimes we hear this statement. Don't just sit there. Do something. We hear that a lot, don't we? Now, listen, that, that, that sometimes is great advice. Sometimes spiritually, that's terrible advice. Because here's the other side of that. Sometimes we could say this and it's the right thing to say. Don't just do something. Sit there. There's some times where we need to wait on the Lord. We need to wait and see what he's doing in a situation. We need to allow him to work. And, other and, and, and what are we doing? We're just doing something. We, we, we have a, I, I, not everybody's this way. But a lot of us, if you're a type A personality or, or, or if you're just a goer, and some people are, you just, and you may not be a type A personality, but sometimes you can't sit down. Gina and I, we'll, we'll go to put on a movie sometimes. And Gina, what are you doing while we're trying to watch, we're trying to watch a movie? She's up doing something. She's, I, I got, are we watching this movie or not? Uh, well, I, yeah, I've just got to get these load of clothes in the dryer. I got to get this load out. I'm like, they'll be there when it's out. I thought we were going to watch the movie. So sometimes, look, spiritually, sometimes instead of just sitting there, we ought to do something. But sometimes instead of just doing something, we ought to sit there. And I think it, this is one of those cases where it probably would have been a good situation for Peter and the guys just to sit there and to spend time praying and, and, and just waiting on what God wanted to do in their lives. They were where he told them to be, but now, oh man, we're going to jump back into this. Otherwise, uh, others, others believe that Peter had been called from that kind of life, and I agree with this, and that it was wrong for him to, re to, to return to that. Furthermore, when he went fishing, Peter took six other men with him. 
So he influenced others. And, and let me say this. If he were wrong, if Peter's just doing what Peter wants to do right here, and that's what it appears. He didn't have a word from the Lord. The Lord didn't say go back to, to uh, the Galilee area and go fishing. He said, go back to Galilee. You'll see me there. I'll meet with you there. But Peter, Peter's done got up. He said, I'm going fishing. Now, if he's wrong in that, then they were wrong too in doing that. And it's a sad thing when a, when a believer leads another believer in the wrong way. Folks, be careful how you influence others. Be careful what you prop up as a freedom that I have. Be careful when you say that this is what the Lord has, has led me to do. Be, be sure it is what the Lord's led you to do and not what you want to do. Because when you start influencing others, it's, a, it's bad enough when we make the wrong decisions. But when we lead others astray by our decisions, that's a bad place to be. Peter was going back to what he knew, back to his comfort zone. Remember Peter failed. I mean, we don't forget that. He failed. He denied the Lord three times. Now, most likely, the first time that Peter had a, saw the resurrected Lord, I just have to believe, and I, I've read some that suggest this, there's nothing in the scriptures that, that let us know for sure what he did. But we understand this. We never see in, in the interactions between Peter and the Lord, we never see that interaction about the denial. We don't hear that conversation. I think that's a private conversation the Lord had with Peter. And I think it was a situation of bringing forgiveness there for Peter. I, I, I'm just thoroughly convinced that that's the case. So they, they dealt with that situation of his fall, of his denying the Lord. And, and that, you know, he failed, but he had been forgiven of that. Now, I, I, I'd, I'd venture to ask you this question. I want you to think about it. But I think a lot about Peter in, in that sin. And that was sin, to deny the Lord. I really can't think of anything worse that we could do as a believer than to deny the Lord. You say, well, murder would be worse. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, we can be forgiven. Listen, every sin, there's only one sin that cannot be forgiven, and that is disbelief. God will not forgive your sin of not believing him. Okay? So people go, well, you, you know, if you kill somebody, if you ever commit murder, but there's, there's tons of testimonies of people who have committed murder, maybe been saved after that. Maybe they got their hearts right with God after that. Are you going to tell me a believer can't murder someone? I believe a believer, I believe a Christian can do anything anybody else can do. You just get away from the word, you get away from praying, you get away from fellowship with God's people, and you can go right down the road with the rest of the world. You can do anything. Understand that. Don't think that because you're a believer, well, I'm protected from doing certain things. You are not. The stories again and again and again of men and women who fell in immorality, believers who have fallen into great sin. There's a lot of great sin. You, you can think about all these different sins. I cannot think of a worse sin than what Peter did. He walked with the Lord all that time. Popped off at the mouth. Lord, I'd never, I'd never deny you after the Lord told him he was going to. I'd never do that. Man, just hours later, he's denied the Lord. Can you, I mean, there's just nothing worse that I can think of than that. Denying our Lord, denying our Savior, now, I want to say this. If he could forgive Peter, and he did forgive Peter, then he can forgive you. Amen. Okay? Now, he has forgiven you. And, and I don't care what your sin is. If it's, if it's adultery... If it's abortion, if it's you shot somebody, even if you denied the Lord. Here's the deal. The Lord forgives. Here's what we do. We confess it. We confess it and we receive forgiveness from the Lord. And we talk a lot about this, about forgiving myself. Um... I've shared this before, but we've, we've got this idea of I have to forgive myself. And there's not anything in Scripture we find about me forgiving myself. Here's what we have to do. We have to receive forgiveness from the Lord. 
We allow, he's forgiven. If he's forgiven, then, then boy, how arrogant and how prideful is it, is it for me to hold on to a sin that God has forgiven and go, well, God, you can forgive it, but I'm not going to forgive it. And then you know where that comes from? That comes out of the pit of hell to keep you locked up to a, a sin of the past that the Lord has already sprung the prison door open. He's made you free and you stay in the cage because you want to be in the cage. That's not where God wants you. Confess whatever your sin. Confess that sin. Receive forgiveness from the Lord and get out of that cage and live in freedom. Live in freedom, amen? Amen. I don't know who needs to hear that this morning. Maybe all of us need to hear that this morning. Don't refuse the Lord's forgiveness. And don't be holier than God in that you won't forgive yourself for, for something that he forgives. Let it go. Let it go. Move on in victory. Receive that victory from the Lord and, 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 and worship him and thank him for that. And then move forward with God in doing the things he wants you to do. So we get back and we find Peter now. So, But Peter's not sure what to do now. So he don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm forgiven, but I'm, I'm, I'm following the Lord. He told us to come over here to Galilee, but I don't know what to do now. He feels like he wants to go back because he's, he's like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I even qualify now to be a, a disciple anymore. You know, and he may have actually been in a little bit of self-pity right here. He may have truly felt that he was no longer qualified to serve the Lord. So Peter goes back to his comfort zone. And he wasn't the only one that did that. Think back to, um, think back to the two that were on the road to Emmaus. What were they doing? They were going home. Well, the Lord's dead. The Lord's dead. I've, enough of this. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I'm, I'm going back. So they're, they're heading home. And, and they had packed up their camp. They headed back to their comfort zone. And Jesus comes to them and he educates them about himself. In fact, it says he goes through all of the prophets and the scriptures and he teaches them of himself. And, and then he reveals himself to, us, uh, to, to, to them. And what do they do? They turn around, man, they go right back to the disciples. They go back and they share, we've seen the Lord. Thomas, you know, Thomas may have always been a skeptic. I don't know. Maybe that's kind of that. We've thrown that doubting Thomas thing on, but maybe he's always been a bit of a skeptic. I mean, you know, you got to show me for me to believe it, that kind of thing. And, and maybe he goes right back into that comfort zone of doubting. And maybe he wasn't with them because his comfort zone might have been you know, being a loner. Maybe he just wanted to be off by himself. He wasn't going to be with everybody else. I'm going to be by myself right now. That's what, that might have been his comfort zone. Uh, Jesus comes and tells him, fill my hands, thrust your hand in my side. And Thomas was thoroughly convinced at that point. He, he was converted and he says, my Lord and my God, he was saved right there. And, and, and so he's out of his comfort zone. You know, Mary, Mary was coming to anoint the body of the Lord. And I find it interesting that it was her and some of the other ladies that were coming. And I just can't help but think maybe true, maybe, maybe Mary, Mary truly maybe loved the Lord more than anybody else. She may have truly had a greater love for the Lord than anybody else. And her comfort zone was in worshiping the Lord. She, he was her comfort zone. And so even in his death, what did she want to do? She wanted to come and anoint his body. She wanted to take care of him because she loved him. She wanted to go there and to be close to him. It was that kind of a thing. And the Lord revealed himself to her first. I think what a blessing. What a blessing to be the first to see the risen Lord. That's incredible. Whether Peter and his friends were right or wrong, you know, we can't prove that. And I personally think they were wrong in going back. But we do know this, that their efforts were in vain. So when they go back, we're going to go back to the old lifestyle. Their efforts were in vain. Verse 5, then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? Now, they're professional fishermen. A few of them on that boat were professional fishermen. Peter was a professional fisherman. Now, they've gone back to doing what we do best. We've gone back to our comfort zone. We're doing what I know how to do, Lionel. I know how to do this. I don't know what to do otherwise, but I know fishing. I'm going to get in my boat. I'm going fishing. I'm going to provide for my family now. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that because that, apparently that's, that door's closed. I'm going to go do what now I think I need to do. And they're out fishing all night. They don't catch a single fish. And can you imagine the embarrassment of answering that question? Hey, hey guys, 
Have you caught any breakfast? You got anything on there to eat? Mm, no. What? No. Huh? Can't hear you. No. They haven't caught a thing. And they're embarrassed. They got to be embarrassed by that. And you, and, you, and you think, you know, had they forgotten the Lord's words? In John 15, 5, he says, without me, you can do nothing. Here they go immediately. We're going to just, we're going to go do our own thing. And they go out there and they can do nothing. Professional fishermen can't f- catch fish. They fished all night and didn't catch a single one. Surely Peter must have remembered what happened when Jesus called him to be a disciple a full-time disciple back in John, uh, Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, record that. And on that occasion, Peter had fished all night and caught nothing, and then Jesus turned that failure into success. Perhaps Peter's impulsive and self-confidence were revealing themselves again right here, where he just says, I'm going to make my decisions, I'm going to do what I want to do, and that's what we so often do when we seek to get back into our comfort zone. We start making decisions. I don't even have to I'm put a period right there. We start making the decisions. Instead of the Lord guiding and directing, we start. And he did. And, and listen, Peter was sincere. I believe he was probably sincere. He worked hard. And, and what was the results? There, there were no results. There was nothing. And you know what? We experience that oftentimes too in, in our Christian walk. We experience that very thing. You see, we, we might be serving without the Lord's leading or direction. Well, I'm going to do what I want to do. This is what I want to do, so this is what I'm going to do. And, and people say, well, people don't really do that. Yeah, we, uh, we, they do. We had a guy in Indiana who, who once, um, I don't think he was qualified to be a pastor. I don't think he was ready to be a pastor if he was qualified. And yet a church called him, and, and the church was desperate for someone. They called him, and uh, he said, oh, absolutely, the Lord has called me to this. I am absolutely confident that the Lord has called me. And he wasn't there two months. He was back at church. Like, dude, what are you doing here? I thought you were a pastor in a church. And he admitted to me. He, he, he swallowed his pride and he admitted to me. He says, you know, I, I have to confess. He said, the Lord didn't lead me to do that. That's what I wanted to do. And it, and it didn't work. It was a miserable failure and quickly. You say, well, do people really do that? Yeah, we oftentimes, we serve. We can do it here. We get into ministry. We really, that's not where we're supposed to be. But it's where I want to be. Uh, or or we're, just, we're just, we just, uh, we're doing just to do. You know, we're doing something just to do something, not truly motivated by my walk with Christ. I want to check the box because, you know, that's what I've always grown up here and I'm supposed to serve somewhere, so I'm going to do it and I'm going to bring my misery to everybody else that I serve with. I'm going to make life heck for you because it's heck for me. I don't want to be in here, and, but, I, you know, I'm supposed to serve, so I got to check the box this morning. I checked Sunday morning, so I got to check serving on there too. I got to do that. You know what we do that? We do, do just to do sometimes. That's the wrong reason to, to serve. We need to be motivated by our, our love for the Lord and our walk with him. Maybe we're not seeking his guidance and blessing on, on our service, on what we do. We, we just, again, we're just doing it. We're not asking for his blessing. Now listen to the statement. When we do anything in our own power, when we do anything in our own power, we can fully expect to be blessed by our own power. Y'all get that? When we do something in our own power, you know, here's what we do. We do stuff a lot of times, we do it, and then we, after the fact, we ask the Lord to bless it. You know what blessing you're going to receive when you do it in your own power? You're going to receive your power. Your blessing and your power is what's going to bless bless what you did. And we know that we can't do anything without the Lord. And so it's not going to be a blessing. So their efforts were in vain. Professional fishermen fished all night and caught nothing. It was time for Jesus to take over the situation just as he did when he first called Peter. He told them them where to cast the net. He said, cast it on the other side of the boat there. And they obeyed, which is, I find that very interesting, um, maybe he had humbled them enough by asking them if they'd caught anything that they, they, they were just humbled at that point. I don't know. But he said, cast your net on the other side. Cast it out on the right side. And they did. They obeyed. They just did what he said. And they caught 153 fish. Now, now you're probably thinking like I thought, what's the significant significance of 153 fish? Um, I'm going to tell you, deep, deep theology right here. This is, this is what it is. I, re- I did. I researched this this week. Here's the, here's the theology of this. 153 fish, it's a lot of fish, okay? That's basically what we come to. There doesn't seem to be any significance to the number of 153 other than that's a whole lot of fish. And in that, in that net, and the nets didn't break. It's 
It's miraculous that the nets didn't break. But it was just 153 fish. It's a whole bunch of fish. It's a contrast. I mean, it's one thing when you go all night, you don't catch a thing. It's one thing if you throw the net out. Oh, they caught one. We caught one. What a coincidence. No, they went from they didn't catch a thing to that 153, 153 fish in the net. There wasn't no going, well, that was just a lucky call. They knew, they knew God had done something. And the difference between success and failure was the width of the ship. Those are small boats. Those who've been to Israel, we've seen the Jesus boat. There were fishing boats in those days, the size of them. They weren't very big. You, you, would have, you could have just turned and thrown it to the other side. And they probably cast on all sides of the boat that night. But they did what God said. And the difference between success and failure was simply the width of the, of the ship and, and following the Lord's direction. We're never far from success when we, when we permit Jesus to give the orders and we're usually closer to success than we realize. We want success our way. Yeah, you know, I'm just thinking about something that I've, I've been sharing a little bit on Wednesday nights, but there's, there's, a, there's a situation that we've been dealing with a little bit, and uh, one of the things that, that I heard said was that these, these people who are, are running a little power play in a church, it's not that they don't want the church to succeed, but they want the church to succeed their way. They want to be in charge. They want to just throw off all of Scripture and, and scriptural authority and do it their way. And they want it to be a success. They want it to grow. They want to see things happen. That's not how it works, folks. You know, you throw off, you throw off God's protection, his guidance, his direction. You're, you're not going to have his blessing. So what can we learn from this story? Listen, going back is never good. Amen. Going back is never good. Keep pressing on with Jesus. Um, our efforts and our comfort zone are in vain. So here's what happens. Things start to get uncomfortable. We go back. We want to go back. We, we, we draw back. We back up from where we were. And, and, and man, then our efforts, when we're outside of God's will because we're going back into the things he's called us away from, there's no blessing in that. Without him, we can do nothing. And here's a great promise that we can always hold to is he never leaves us and he never forsakes us. Never. Regardless of our situation in life, regardless of where we are in life, man, he never, ever, 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 ever leaves us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. That means he never turns his back on us and he never walks away. The Lord is right there. He's right there. When the Lord saves us, he begins this process of making us fishers of men. Every one of you in here, if you're a believer, if you truly have been born again, then God is in the process of making you fishers of men. He's not just looking to make you uh, this, these angelic beings because you don't become angels. <laughs> Understand that. You don't die and become an angel. Well, the Lord just needed another angel. We don't become angels. We'll never be angels. What we are is fishers of men. That's what God wants us to be. Every believer is to be a fisher of men. We may, not, we may have different roles in that calling, but we all have that calling and must obey that calling. We, we in our mission committee, as we vet different missionaries, we find some are church planting missionaries. There are a lot of others that are in support roles. Some of our missionaries here were more in support roles. Some of our missionaries here were in, in the direct church planting efforts. But it's all a part of being fishers of men. Our ministry is right here. From the pulpit... Being a fisher of men. If it's teaching a small group, it's fisher of men. If it's leading a, a, a women's ministry or a men's ministry or, or visitation or whatever it is, it should be fishers of men. As you're teaching these children, you're being fishers of men. As we obey, we've got different roles, but it's the same goal of being fishers of men, bringing people to Christ. It's interesting that at least seven of the 12 disciples were probably fishermen. And, and so it makes you ask the question, why, why so many fishermen uh, we're called to follow him. Well, think about this with fishermen. Number one, fishermen know how to work. Number two, they have, they're uh, courageous and they have faith to go out into the deep water. They, they, uh, also, uh, they're also dedicated to one thing and cannot easily be distracted. Number four, they have much patience and persistence and they will not quit. Now, we're thinking about here professional fishermen, not, not those that are on vacation and casting a few things in. Because I don't like fishing. I don't like fishing, folks. I like catching. <laughs> I like catching. We all change the name of it because if I ain't catching, uh, my, the fun meter runs out pretty fast for me. I'm not one that's going to be on a boat for eight hours and, man, we ain't got a bite. Well, the next bite's coming soon. It's coming. 
We've had eight hours for that bite. I'm not, no. Uh, number five, they, they know how to take orders and they know how to work together. And number six, they're skilled in using the equipment and the boat. Man, that's, that, the Lord called fishermen. We can learn from that as we look at fishermen. They're tough. They're hardworking. They work together. They're focused. They're committed. They're not fearful. All these things. So Jesus called the disciples and us to be fishers of men. And this phrase, it was not... It was not a phrase that was invented by Jesus. You know, I think we think that, that Jesus said, well, I'm going to make you fishers of men, and that would, have been, that would have been, you know, he created that. But in fact, as they've studied out the language, they found that that, that was a phrase that was used for years by Greek and Roman teachers. And here's the idea. So to be a fisher of men in that day meant to seek, to persuade men, and catch them with the truth. And isn't that exactly what Jesus makes us? He wants us to be fishers of men, to seek to persuade men and catch them with the truth. That's, folks, that's what we're to do. You know, I've I've heard it said, it's not our job to save anybody. It's not my job to convince anybody. It's not my job to convict anybody. It's not my job to change anybody's heart. It is my job to tell. We are to share the gospel, and we're seeking to persuade them as we tell them the truth. A fisherman catches live fish, and when he catches them, they die. But a Christian witness who becomes a fisher of men seeks to catch dead fish, dead in their trespasses and sins, and when he or she catches them, then they are made alive in Christ. When they are persuaded by truth. Are you a fisher of men? Are you a fisher of men? When you got saved and the Lord pulled you out of your comfort zone, and he did, I believe that absolutely when you got saved, if you truly got saved, there was a time you were out of your comfort zone. He was calling you to do new things and go new places and talk to new people. And man, it was uncomfortable. But are you still out of your comfort zone or have you gone back? Well, I'm not getting baptized in front of all those people. It's out of my comfort zone. I can't speak publicly. It's out of my comfort zone. I can't pray out loud. It's out of my comfort zone. I don't have the time to commit to that ministry. It's out of my comfort zone. I can't go there. It's out of my comfort zone. I can't give that much. It's out of my comfort zone. I can't witness to people. It's out of my comfort zone. Folks, can't never could. Can't never could. Can't's a pretty poor excuse to not do what God is leading us to do. Have you gone back? Have you pulled back? Have you returned to your comfort zone? As fishers of men, the Lord wants us to work His work. He wants us to be courageous and exercise faith to go into the deep waters. It means we've got to overcome fear. He wants us to be dedicated and not easily distracted. It means we're to be focused on our faith. He wants us to be patient and persistent and not quit, not go back. He wants us to take orders and work together. He wants us to use the resources that are available to us in this goal of fishing for men. And that's the word of God in prayer. Use the tools he's given us. We are indeed fishers of men and there are fish all around us. You know, those fish, they fished all night in their own efforts. There were fish all around them, all in that sea. That's a sea full of fish. It's teeming with life, and and, and probably, I would guess, much more so then than even today. And even today, the Sea of Galilee is teeming with life. There were fish everywhere, and yet, in their own efforts, they didn't catch a one. But when they listened to what God said, and they trusted Him, they filled the nets. Filled the nets. If we obey his directions and follow his leading, we will catch fish. We won't just be fishers of men. We'll be catchers of men and catchers of women and catchers of boys and of girls. We've got to get out of our comfort zone. You find yourself in an uncomfortable situation, don't don't give in to the... the, uh, the temptation of going back. Press on. But here's what I'd say is, this Christian life ought to become the new normal. 
And, and then when the Lord calls us to go further and it stretches us out of our comfort zone, let's not go back to the way it was here in my Christian walk, but we keep pressing on in our Christian walk. Amen? Amen. Pastor Aaron, if you'll come, and Jim. So we have an invitation here in a moment. We'll have a song. Pastor Aaron and Jim will lead us in a song. Um, I'll invite you to stand this morning. With In a moment, I'll invite you to stand and, and sing with us. But I'll, I just want you to think this morning. Christian, are you, are you uncomfortable? As a believer, if we're uncomfortable, that's a good place to be. For six years, I've been uncomfortable. I've been uncomfortable. The Lord's called me into, and I'd never pastored before. And there's every, every day, almost, there are situations that I find very uncomfortable still. But I don't want to be comfortable. I want to be obedient. Amen. I, I want to be where God wants me to be. I want to be doing what he wants me to do. And I hope that's your desire as well. So this morning for you as a believer, if, if you've pulled back from what God has led you to do, called you to do, created you to do, saved you to do, if you've pulled back, maybe this morning it's just come time to talk to, talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I, you know, I pulled back from this area. I've not given the way I'm supposed to give. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm not committed the way I'm supposed to commit. I got, I got uncomfortable, Lord, and maybe I've pulled back. Maybe you're right in the midst of, of battling that, that you're not comfortable this morning. Maybe you've been tempted to pull back. Go back into that comfort zone. Maybe this morning would be a great time to just come pray and say, Lord, give me strength. Lord, I'm uncomfortable. Help me, help me to get used to being uncomfortable and not resist that and pull away from it. Whatever it is God's doing in your heart this morning, believer, I hope you'll respond to that. You can pray right there where you are, but I really encourage you. This is, this is an altar here. It's a place to come and, and deal with God about what he's dealing with you about. Amen? Now, this morning, if you're here and, and, and you, you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've never been born again, you go, preacher, I'm not sure I really understand what that means. Well, it's simple. We're all separated from God by our sin. All are sinners. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we're separated from God by our sin. But here's the good news. Here's, here's what's good about the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The good news of that is that because of our sin, God sent his son Jesus, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and Jesus went, the, went to the cross of Calvary. And on that cross, he was nailed to that cross, and he bore your sin, and he bore my sin. He died for our sin. He took your place. He took my place on that cross. He took the punishment that should have been ours, the judgment that should have been ours, the death that should have been ours. He died that in our place. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And he proved right there that he was God. And he proved he could do what he said he would do. And what he said is, if you'll put your faith and your trust in me, I'll forgive your sin. And, and I'll come in and I'll, and I'll dwell within you I'll give you life eternal. And that's the promise he's given this morning. And you say, preacher, I'm not sure I understand all that, but I know this morning this, that I'm not saved and I need Jesus. Then I'd invite you to step forward. Come down here. I'll, I'll take the Bible. I'll, I'll introduce you again. I'll share with you. You can leave here this morning. You can leave here knowing that you know that you know. It doesn't have to be a guessing game. Well, I hope I'm good enough today. There ain't none of that. None of us are good enough. Only Jesus can save us. So this morning, if you need to be saved, I invite you to come forward. So if you'll stand with me. Father God, thank you for your word this morning. I, I pray that, it, that you'll just take what has been said. You'll use it. Lord, maybe this morning there's somebody who's hurting because they've not received forgiveness for sin in their life or something there. And, and Lord, they're just, they're just hurting. I pray that you'll bring victory this morning in that area. I pray for those, maybe some that have gone back. They've pulled back away from what you've, you've called them to. Lord, I, I pray that we'd get that right with you this morning and we'd, we'd be willing to get out of our comfort zone to follow you and do what it is you want us to do. Lord, those that may, may be there out of their comfort zone right now, they're following you and they're feeling the pressure. Pray you give them strength this morning. and that they'll, they'll, just, they'll just drive a stake in the ground. I'm not backing up. I'm not going back to where I've been. But I'm going to move forward with you, Lord. So whatever needs to be done, 
If it's for salvation, we pray for salvation. If it's for a, a, a refocusing of, our, of ourselves to you, I pray that'll be the case. But Lord, whatever it is you're dealing with our hearts on, I pray we'll be obedient to respond to it right now, humble enough to respond. So God, just have your will and way in this time, and we'll praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.